This week, we're going to talk about patient-centered outcomes versus process-centered outcomes. If you're new to the channel, my name is Siju Jacob. I've been a private practitioner for the past 25 years in Bangalore and Dubai. I've been using a surgical microscope in my private practice for more than 20 years and I've been training dentists how to use the surgical microscope in everyday clinical practice for more than a decade. If you've been here before and you found some value in the videos that I post every week, then make sure you click on that subscribe button so that you get notified every time I upload a new video, which is usually every Sunday. You can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter, Wisdom Wednesdays. It's a very short email that I send out every Wednesday to our subscribers. I've put the link in the description below to have a look. To begin with, let's define what exactly we mean by patient-centered outcomes and process-centered outcomes. Patient-centered outcomes measures what actually matters to the patient, the impact on their health, comfort, and function. Process-centered outcomes, on the other hand, measures whether a particular procedure or clinical step was performed correctly or efficiently. So patient-centered outcomes, in a nutshell, or in layman's language is, what exactly does the patient want and does the procedure satisfy the needs of the patient, the outcome that the patient wants, not what the operator wants. Process-centered outcomes, on the other hand, is more related to the, the procedures that you do in the clinic. In a very, very blunt way, if you look at it, a cardiac surgeon performing a bypass surgery, he or she does a procedure which is textbook, you know, classic bypass surgery, which is something that the peers would be proud of, but the outcome is that the patient didn't make it, the patient passed away. So that's what you call a poor patient outcome, whereas the process is good. You know, So from a process-centered outcome, the surgeon did a great job, but from a patient-centered outcome, which means the patient needed to live and happily for a few more years down the road, the patient didn't make it, so it's a poor patient-centered outcome. So that's how you differentiate between the two, and we see this in endodontics as well. So let's look at some patient-centered outcomes. Patients come to the clinic, He's got a big bubble here on the cheek, so that's the patient's problem. I have this big boil on the side of my cheek. I think it's cancer. Do something. You know, so the patient's problem is that. And in order to have a great outcome, this problem that the patient has, which is this big boil on the buccal surface of the maxillary first molar, uh, needs to disappear in order for the patient to have a good outcome. So what do we do? We go in there, we find that a sinus tract tracing leads to the mesiobuccal root. We take a CBCD and we find that there's a missed canal. So we go back in there through the existing crown. We find the MB2, clean out the MB1, and then obturate the MB1 and the MB2. And then that's the pre-op and this is a post-op. The patient's bubble disappears, patient's able to chew, the tooth is in function, and the patient's problem is solved. So this is an example of patient-centered outcomes. Now let's look at process-centered outcomes. This is an example of process-centered outcomes. For example, the patient comes here to the clinic with dislodged permanent restoration. You take a radiograph and you look at this tooth and say that, you know, this root canal doesn't look good because none of the principles have been followed. No cleaning, no shaping, no obturation. However, it's a good patient-centered outcome because the patient's had this tooth for 40 years. However, in order to make this a good process-centered outcome, we improve the cleaning, shaping, obturating, and then this is how the root canal looks after re-endo. So for the dentist, this is a good outcome. This is a good process-centered outcome because we've redone the whole process and done better cleaning, better shaping, and better obturation. So this is what you call a process-centered outcome. These are the things that clinician looks at in endodontics when they look at process-centered outcomes. Did we do a proper cleaning? Did we do a proper shaping? And did we do a proper obturation? So let's look at some other examples of process-centered outcomes. So patient lands up in the clinic and this is a root canal done 40 years ago, no symptoms. They've had this tooth for 40 years. The only reason they've come is because the coronal restoration is dislodged. Now, if you are looking at only a patient-centered outcome, then all you need to do is change the coronal restoration and probably put an indirect restoration and the job is done. But because we are dentists and we focus on process-centered outcomes, we retreat this tooth. So we go in there, remove the temporary filling, remove the silver cones and whatever is there inside, clean, shape, put calcium hydroxide and then bring the patient back after a week and then obturate this tooth 
And then this is how it looks after the procedure. So this is a process-centered outcome because remember, the patient never had any problems to start with. They've had this tooth for 40 years. So all we've done is we've improved the process. It means this radiograph looks better to us because we've cleaned it better, shaped it better, and obturated better. But as far as the patient's concerned, it makes no difference to them because they didn't have any symptoms and they don't have any symptoms even now after you've done your process-centered outcomes. The only thing they're worried about is, did you put a coronal restoration or not? So once you do that part, that solves the patient-centered outcome. But yeah, so this is an example. Now let's look at a case where both patient-centered outcome and process-centered outcomes go hand in hand. And this is what happens for the majority of endodontic cases. So you have a tooth here, which is endotreated crown. There's a screw post here and there's a big lesion. Patients come with a lot of pain and swelling. And so what we do here is we do a standard retreatment endodontics. We dis disassemble the crown, take out the crown, disassemble the coronal restoration, you can see here that's a metal post. We remove the metal post and then remove all the existing gutta percha and there's pus discharge from the canal. So we clean it out and then put calcium hydroxide. And then you can see here a little bit of calcium hydroxide there. Bring the patient back after a month or so when all the symptoms have subsided. And then we obturate the tooth and put a new fiberglass post and coronal restoration. So this is the post-op. This is how we ended up. And then a year later when the patient shows up, that's the one-year recall. So this is how we started a pre-op and that's the one-year recall. So this is a great example of a patient-centered outcome along with the process-centered outcome. So everybody's happy. The endodontist is happy because all the processes have been followed. Patient's happy because symptoms have been resolved. So it's a win-win situation. And this is what usually happens for most endodontic cases. Can you have a patient-centered outcome without process-centered outcome? Of course you can. This is a great example. And I've shown you these cases in previous videos as well. And we see this all the time. Patient walks in, root canals done 40 plus years ago, no problem at all. The only reason they've come here is that they have some food impaction because the coronal restriction is dislodged. So all they want you to do is correct this part because that's the only problem they have. Or there's some food impaction because of a loose crown. They don't have any problems endodontically. So what do you do now? Because from a patient-centered outcome, this is good. You know, patient's happy. They have, don't have any problem. The only problem they have is the coronal restoration. So are you going to solve that problem of the coronal restoration alone? Or are you going to go the whole hog and just do the entire process-centered outcomes along with the patient-centered outcomes? So these are the dilemmas that we all face in everyday clinical practice. So here's another example where patient-centered outcomes often clashes with process centered outcomes. So here you have a patient where they've come to your practice and the endodontic therapy was done just three years ago with newer instruments, rotary night tie, and then three years later the patient comes back with a fracture like this and a sinus tract on the buccal surface. And now you have a look, you take a scan, and then you tell the patient that this tooth needs to be extracted. And then the patient says, Doc, I did this root canal 50 years ago. How come that's still staying and your new modern one which you've done with microscopes and the newer instruments didn't even last for three years? And we don't really have answers for that. So this is an example of a patient-centered outcome because an endodontist or a general dentist would look at this case and say, whoa, what a terrible endo. You know, they've put these silver cones and one silver cone is protruding past the apex. So this is not a good root canal, but the patient would say, I've had this for 50 years and I'm perfectly fine. And I've had these new fancy looking root canal for just three years and it didn't even last three years. So from a patient-centered outcome, this is a poor outcome. But from a process-centered outcome, this is a better outcome than this. So sometimes we have these problems and we don't really know how to solve this problem. So in an ideal world, it would always be great if the patient-centered outcome and the process-centered outcomes are matching. They kind of gel together, but very often in clinical practice, this is not the case. So it probably makes sense to have a patient-centered outcome first and then see if you can marry the process to the patient-centered outcome rather than the other way around. Because a lot of us clinicians, we tend to do the opposite. We focus on processes without really emphasizing whether or not those processes benefit the patient or potentially could harm the patient. So we believe in what we call titrated treatment, which is sort of a midway and sometimes not a standard line of treatment. What we mean by titrated treatment is we focus on patient-centered outcome rather than process-centered outcomes. And rather than blindly follow the standard endodontic triad, we use radiographs and CBCT to perform titrated treatment. So we narrow down interventional options for the benefit of the patient.
Let me give you some examples. So if you get a tooth like this, in a standard philosophy, we would dismantle this whole tooth. We would take out the crown, we will take out this metal post, and then we would do a retreatment and then look at restoring the whole tooth. But in a titrated treatment, we would take a CVCT and then we would see, is the lesion restricted to just this root? Or is there any lesion at all with these two roots? So if there is no lesion, periapical lesion with these two teeth, then we would probably make an attempt to retain the crown and then just retreat the mesial root. So this is an example of titrated treatment. Let me show you some clinical cases. This is an example where the patient had a crown and an endodontic therapy. The crown's fitting well, but they have some tenderness a few years down the road. So we take a CBCT and we find that there's a missed MB2 canal and that it has a separate portal of exit. So rather than disassembling the entire tooth because the rest of the teeth and the canals are doing fine. So what we do in this case is we do selective retreatment, which is go in there specifically and then retreat the mesiobuccal canal. So we drain out whatever is there and then obturate that canal alone here. So that's after we obturate it and then we close the axis with a composite core. And this is a post-op. So this is an example of titrated treatment. So we focus on what the patient's problems are and then we try to solve that problem and do the process which solves that problem rather than sticking to all the processes that we have learned and just have sort of a cookie cutter recipe for every single patient that walks in. We kind of titrate treatment depending on the need. So this is what we follow in our practice. This is another example where the patient came to the clinic with a recently done endodontic therapy and a crown and the patient gave a history that the dentist while performing endodontic therapy had broken a K-file beyond the apex of this distal root and now the patient cannot chew. Every time he bites on this tooth, the patient has pain. So again, an example of titrated treatment because in a classic retreatment, we would dismantle this whole crown, go into all the three canals and do a proper retreatment. But because the problem is only in the distal root, we don't need to touch the mesial root what we do here is we make a selective access through the distal root, go into the distal canal, remove the distal obturation, find that there's a K file or H file there, and then we bypass this on either sides and kind of put two instruments and, you know, grasp it, braid it up and take it out. So we remove that broken instrument that way and then re-obturate just the distal canal. So this is the pre-op and that's the post-op with the instrument removed here and the canals obturated. So another example of titrated treatment. So there are many cases like this, which I can show you case after case. Now here's a case where somebody has done a huge cast post and then put a crown. So in a traditional way, if we were to disassemble and redo this whole treatment, then we would have to take out the whole crown and remove the whole cast post and we don't know whether that's going to result in a good outcome because many times when you go for invasive retreatments like these, then it might land up in a, in a situation where you have to extract the tooth. So rather than straight away extract the tooth and put an implant, we try to buy some more time by doing titrated treatment. So in this case, I would make a selective access into the mesial root because we find out from comb beam CT that the problem is with the mesial buccal canal or missed MB2 rather. So we make a selective access here and you can see the cast post there. We drill through the cast post find the MB2 here, which is here, and then treat the MB2. So you can see here, that's the MB2. And then we obturate the MB2 and close it with a composite restoration. So that's the pre-op and that's the post-op. So again, an example of titrated treatment where we leave the rest of the cast post. Is it ideal? Not really, but that's the best alternative here to achieve a patient-centered outcome along with a limited process-centered outcome rather than go the whole hog key questions you could ask when you are doing titrated treatment is, when was the endodontic therapy done? What was the age of the patient? Does the patient have any systemic diseases? So these are just examples of questions that you need to ask. You can ask a lot more questions and sometimes the answers are not straightforward. Depending on the specific clinical situation, you might need to titrate your process. That means the amount of treatment that you administer is not standardized. It can vary depending on the clinical situation. Let me give you some examples. Okay, Let's say there's a case like this. Now, when you're looking at only process-centered outcomes, you would straight away look at something like this, take a comb beam CD and say, oops, there's a missed root, an entire missed root, so let's go ahead and retreat this. But what if you ask some questions, questions like, when was the endodontic therapy done? And if the patient says, endodontic therapy was done 50 years ago, then you'd have to think, because if something was done 50 years ago, and the only problem is the coronal restoration, there's absolutely no lesion here, then why on earth are you going to redo this? 
Because if something hasn't troubled the patient for 50 years, it's probably unlikely that it's going to trouble them in the next five years. So you probably do more harm treating this than leaving it alone. So it's not as straightforward as we think it is, right? But on the other hand, if the patient says the endodontic therapy was just done a year ago, then yes, we might think of redoing it. Second question, what's the age of the patient? If the patient says, I'm 25 years old or 30 years old, we would redo it because the patient still has another 30 or 40 years to go. But if the patient says, I'm 90 years old, then yeah, we might hesitate because if the patient is 90 years old and the root canal was done, say, 20 years back, then we say, it's not bothered them all this while, so why not leave it alone? So this is how you make these decisions. And in this case, if the patient is young or if the patient's endo was done recently and there is a reason, we might actually go ahead and retreat it, which is what we did in this case. We found the missed canal, obturated that canal, and then this is the post-op of how it looks. So this is an example of titrated treatment. And sometimes the amount of titrated treatment can vary depending on the questions that you ask. So this is what we mean by titrated treatment. Here's another example. Now, this is a dentist, a retired dentist, 85 years old. His son is a dentist, so he bought his dad. And his dad has a problem. There was a sinus tract associated with the second molar. And this is how it looked. On Buckley, there was pus discharge here. We took a cone beam CT and we found out the problem was with the distal canal. There was a missed distal canal. So what we did in his case is, again, after discussion, because he's a dentist, he understands, his son is a dentist, so we had we went a bit back and forth. So we did something unconventional here. We just treated the distal root. So we just made an access through the existing crown in the distal part. We found there's a missed distal canal. We removed the gutta percha from both these canals. And then we put calcium hydroxide. A week later, a couple of weeks later, he comes back, the sinus tracts heal. So we remove the calcium hydroxide and obturate the distal canal. And then that's how the patient went back. So this is the post-op. So we just treated the distal canal. Although the mesial canals are short, there wasn't much of a lesion there. So the son decided along with the dad and the clinician that let's just redo the canal which is causing the problem and then leave it like that. And then let's reevaluate this tooth a few years down the road. So yes, because he's a dentist, the conversation is a little more easier. So the situation matters. It's not always a straightforward. It's not always a cookie cutter formula. There are these small, small nuances that you have to take into consideration when we we treat patients in the clinic. That's the purpose of this lecture. In this particular case, you know, hindsight is, always makes you wiser. This patient turned up four years down the road and four years later, you see the mesial root is fractured. So who knows? Maybe if we retreated this, this two would have fractured. We don't know. Okay, may or may not have fractured. But in hindsight, when you look at these two teeth, this has fractured four years down the road and this has and this is still there and it's functional so there's no issue so hindsight makes you wiser what if the patient comes back four years later and there's like a huge lesion over here on the mesial root well this is where the problem lies hindsight makes you wiser and hindsight makes you foolish so in this particular case you tend to look wiser because you decided not to redo the mesial root and then four years later the patients come back in another tooth where the mesial roots fracture so yeah, these are the little nuances that aren't really straightforward. So those are the risks that we take when we work in everyday clinic practice. So two things I want to remind you when you look at these presentations. When you do titrated treatment, I really believe that you need to use two tools. One is the cone beam CT because you need to have all the information before you do partial treatment. And the second is, of course, the microscope. So with these tools, you can do a better job at assessing the image and we can do what we call image guided treatment, which means you have all the information, you know for sure that this is the canal that causes the problem and then you aim at titrating the necessary treatment based on the data we receive. And these cases that I just showed you, for example, selectively retreating one canal or two is something that you really can't do effectively without a microscope. And I've been going on and on about the microscope course. If you've been on this channel, you know it's something that I go on harping about. Do check out the online course, Microscopic Dentistry Simplified. It's a very, very small course that virtually any dentist can go through and implement the microscope in your own clinical practice so that you can administer titrated treatment, conservative treatment, so that you can match patient outcomes in a way better manner rather than being married to standard 
processes which are probably a little too invasive depending on the patient's needs and clinical condition. So that's the purpose of this lecture. If you enjoy what you've seen here, then make sure you click on that subscribe button so that you get notified every time I upload a new video. And if you'd like to subscribe to my weekly newsletter, Wisdom Wednesdays, which is a very short email that I send out every Wednesday filled with clinical notes, reflections, book recommendations, things like that, then do subscribe to my weekly newsletter, Wisdom Wednesdays. I've put the link in the description below. If you enjoy more videos like this, then maybe you should check out my other videos on this channel. I'll see you next Sunday with another video. Till then, take care. Thanks for watching.